Father God, we thank you for today, and um, we thank you for this weekend and everything that the youth group did with D-Now. Lord, I pray that you will be with everyone during this service and open up their hearts and that you will speak through John and um, help them, everyone else, to just hear what he has to say. Father, we thank you for everything, and we praise you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. It doesn't matter how much the bill is. Because Jesus has paid it all, we're saved by grace. Let's stand together and sing, if you would, please. Jesus paid it all. Amen. We are back in town. Larry's got his jacket off. Come on up. David Kim Finkel, come on up. <clears throat> on behalf of the Texas uh, World Hunger Offering, uh, let me say thanks to Trinity Baptist Church. We were able to take up as a church 
uh, $5,456 for the offering. A little over half of that was taken up by pledges that the three of us were able to secure, and the other part was taken up in our offering last week. And uh, so I just want to say thank you for your support. Uh, we will have an opportunity, as David said, coming back. Uh, are we going to do this again next year? And uh, I think our hope is yes, and we might see some more people up here with us that have a nice shirt that they can wear. But thank you for your support and all the help. These guys did a great job all week getting there. I want to share also with you this morning... This has been a special weekend with our student ministry. Uh, We've called it Disciple Now. And uh, just so that you know, uh, there were two churches that got together, First Baptist Church, Curryville, and Trinity Baptist Church here in Curryville got together and put our youth groups together. And they were able to spend a weekend talking about what it means to truly follow Christ. And to do so in a way, their theme was saturate. You see uh, some of their shirts up here this morning. And I just want to ask if our, our students, or if you participated or supported in any way with the disciple now, would you stand right now and let us recognize you? Amen. We appreciate you guys. We had a group this morning. You can have a seat this morning that we're here. The ladies were here this morning in our early worship service, and the guys are here in the second service. I know that we will probably hear more about the weekend as time goes on. I uh, had a chance to be with them Friday night as they began, and uh, they got together for a time of worship, a time of challenge, a time of being saturated by the Lord. And uh, hopefully you'll hear more about that. We look forward to good things. It's exciting to know that our youth ministry not only follows us, but leads us. And, and, you know, we go hand in hand together, whether we're senior adults or young people or meeting adults or children, that we as a faith family look to one another to be encouraged. And uh, it's going to be exciting to see what uh, we'll learn from uh, this weekend as our students continue to share. One other thing I want to share with you this week that uh, is going to take place Thursday at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, we'll be having our National Day of Prayer breakfast that will be here at our uh, Family Life Center in the gym. Tickets are $1. Uh, as Larry said last week, you can't go anywhere and get a breakfast for a dollar and have a great time of prayer and, and study and uh, start the day off right. would encourage you to come if you can to be a part of that. It's not a long time, time to come together and then get to work if you need to. Uh, but th- we do need to sell tickets so that we know how much uh, to prepare for. And tickets are available for a dollar. You can get them through the church office. They may be sold at the end of the service out in the foyer as well. Uh, but come and be a part of that. I know Trinity has had a history of celebrating uh, the National Day of Prayer in this way. I want to encourage you to come and be a part of that as, as we celebrate this day together. Our nation needs prayer. Uh, our world needs prayer. Uh, our community needs prayer. And it's great when our community can come together and have a time of prayer like this. So come and support it as uh, we do that together. Uh, as I look around, there are probably uh, some guests that are with us today. I want to welcome you. It's always great to see our church family together, to come from week to week, to be here, to worship together, and come from a time of Bible study over the previous hour where we studied the, group, studied the Word of God in small groups, and then come together for a time of worship. And if you're here and a guest of ours today, we want to say welcome to you. If this is your first time, we hope that you'll find your way to the foyer at the conclusion of our service and take a gift bag with you. Uh, in the gift bag, there's a DVD and some information about about our church, we'd love to put it in your hand. In your worship guide, there's a place for you to tear off and fill out your record of your visit today with us. So we'd love to have that record so that we can get in touch with you and let you know some of the things that are happening right here in Kerrville through Trinity Baptist Church. But the best way we know to say good morning and hello and welcome is by shaking hands and looking in each other's eyes and saying good to see you. So would you stand and greet those that are around you right now?
Do y'all know that I brought with me this morning a very special book? This book is extra special to me. Do y'all know what kind of book this is? It's not a Bible. I have a Bible, and it is very special to me. My Bible is very special to me. But this isn't a Bible. It is a picture book. What is another name for a picture book? Do you know? Anybody? It's called a photo album. That's a big word, isn't it? It's a photo album, but it is a picture book. It has pictures in it. Well, this photo album is extra special to me because it has pictures of my son in them. And it's so special that it has the very first picture when he was born. He's still in the hospital. There he is. First day, very first day when he was born. Is that not the most beautiful baby you have ever seen in your life? I started taking pictures of him before we ever took him home. And I just, I have a bunch of pictures. I have pictures of him in here sitting on the floor. That's important. Look, there he is crawling on the floor. I was so proud of him. And he was growing. And I just kept taking pictures. And, oh, there's pictures of him dressed like a pumpkin. And there's pictures of him in sunglasses. Oh, there's pictures of his first birthday. Is that not just the cutest thing you've ever seen? That is my son. And that was his first birthday. So he kept growing. Do you know that this is not the only photo album I have? I have a whole bunch of these. Because you know what he did? He kept growing and growing. And it was such a joy to watch him grow up. And I was so proud of him. I just kept taking pictures. And I have pictures of him now. But... I mean, just look at that. Is that just not the prettiest baby you've ever seen? Look. See that baby? He is so cute. Well, I kept taking pictures of him, even after he's like almost six feet tall now. And I was so proud of him, and it was such a joy to watch him grow up. Do you know that my son was baptized right here in this church? Do you know what it means to be baptized? Do you know where the baptism mill is right up there? That's where he was baptized, right up there. And I was so proud. Do you know that I was baptized right up there in the same church? Do you know I have a daughter? And she was baptized right up there in the same church. And I have a granddaughter now named Madison. And she was baptized right up there pretty proud. Makes me very happy. But I imagined that every time one of us was baptized, that God was looking down on us, and He was so proud, and He was going, this is my child who I'm very proud of. But do we, did did this cute baby right here, remember him? Did this cute little baby, did he stay a baby? He didn't, did he? He grew up to be such a tall and handsome man. And when we got baptized, we were children of God. Even I was, I was older. I wasn't a kid when I was baptized, but I was a child of God. And I grew, and, jo- and God wanted me to grow up, just like I kind of sort of wanted Him to grow up. Okay? I want to show you a window this morning, and I want to tell you about another baptism that happened. So can you follow me? Let's go over here and look at this window. Come on. Come over here. Follow me. Let's go over here. We're not walking in a line, are we? Come here, Caden. Right here. Right here. Can y'all see this? Come up real close. Look right up there at that. Do y'all know who that is? Who is that? That is. That's Jesus. That's God's Son. And do you know what it said? In Matthew 3, 17, when Jesus was baptized, just like I was baptized and Madison was baptized, When he came up out of the water, the heavens opened up, and Jesus said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. He was very proud of him, wasn't he? Do you want to be a person like that? Do you want to be a kid like that? Where God looks down on us and says, You are my child, and I am very proud of you. 
I do. Even, at, even as old as I am, I do. I get up every day and I try real hard and I work real hard to know what God wants me to do. Jesus knew what God wanted him to do. And so God will be proud of us. Can y'all come stand over? We're going to look up at this window while we say our prayer. Can y'all get you coming a little closer? And we're going to say our prayer. Look right up there. Ready? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you love us so much that you are proud of us like you were proud of your son Jesus. Lord, help us as we look up at this window when we come to church to remember the words that you said and hope that we will be just as proud of us. Heavenly Father, we give you all the thanks and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God has given us a commission to go and to tell and to send the light. Let's stand together as we sing, please. Join me as we pray. Most holy God, we come before you this morning. We are reminded of your holiness, your grace, your power. Only you are worthy of our adoration and praise. Help us to alter everything in our lives that is necessary to draw us closer to you. Teach us your ways, O oh Lord, and make us aware that only you are our light and our salvation. Make us so aware of your enormous blessings in this life that we become grateful contributors of all we have and while we are capable of becoming through the gift of your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much, God, for the opportunity to serve through our faith family here at Trinity. As we come to this time of giving, we are reminded of the great gift of your Son, Jesus Christ.
and we offer this prayer in his holy name. We are also reminded that our sacrifice can never equal your gift of your only Son. Amen. Good morning. God gave us the gift. Our mother, Lola Davis, gave us the love of music in honor of her 90th birthday. This is our gift to her. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in Him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how He changed my life completely He did something that no other
Amen. Thank you, Armor Children. I am a fan of family, and uh, what a joy to get to celebrate uh, with Lola today as uh, her family gets to celebrate her. This past Thursday, Larry and David and I got up in Cameron, Texas. We had a little breakfast. Uh, We got dressed. I put the sunscreen on so we wouldn't be too burned when we got to Waco. And uh, had a great day of riding on level ground to Waco compared to the day before. From Austin to Cameron is not very flat. Uh, And when the winds are blowing between 12 and 20 miles an hour with gusts up to 30, it's even harder. Normally when you go down a hill, you pick up speed. But when the wind is blowing you back up the hill, you have to pedal to get down the hill. It's a hard way to drive and ride for such a long time. But we knew that we had set up to ride for two days, and and, uh, Larry and David uh, did great uh, in their riding. Uh, We took off on Thursday knowing that we were going to arrive in Waco at a decent hour. Uh, You may be aware that uh, some things changed on Thursday for our route because the President of the United States was coming into Waco, so we had to drive a little bit different route to get in. And once we got there, the, uh, the, the plan was that we would find ourselves eating dinner at a place called Outdoor Waco and having pizza. And knowing that a little bit more about Waco than, than maybe David or Larry did, I thought, you know, we don't have to just eat pizza. We can eat uh, something different than pizza. I appreciate so much Lonnie Rollins, who knew about Waco, too. Lonnie traveled up there with us. He drove us to Austin and then went on to Waco to spend some time with his family and then was there in Waco to bring us home. But you may not be aware, but the Food Channel had a national championship that they ran alongside the national championship basketball brackets that were going on with the men and the women. The Food Channel took college towns and their greatest meal, their college meals, and they put them against each other and they voted. And there was a place in Waco that got mentioned on this bracket, uh, a place called Vtex. And and Vtex had a menu item that they called the gut pack. (laughs) A great college meal, a gut pack. It's uh, corn chips with, with barbecue and sauce and beans and cheese and jalapenos and onions and pickles. And then you get either white bread or wheat bread. It is wonderful. It is the greatest uh, invention on, on this side of heaven, I'm sure. Uh, and it is so good that not only was it a competitor in the national championship, it won the national championship college meal. So why are we going to eat pizza, Right. We're in Waco. We're not going to eat pizza. I asked Larry and David and Lonnie and and, uh, uh, my brother-in-law Ben was with us, Ben Hanna. And I said, let's go eat someplace else. So we decided to go to Vtex and we had the gut pack. I am a fan of the gut pack. (laughs) The gut pack is good. It is great. It is so good that I would recommend to you today, if you have time, to go eat dinner in Waco and come back to get a gut pack. Uh, If you're traveling through Waco at any point in time in your life and you're there at a time of a meal, stop by Vtex and get a gut pack because it is worth it. It is so good. Have you ever been a fan of something like that? You ever been a fan of some place to go eat that you liked it so much that you were uh, a vowed uh, loyalist, uh, you were convinced that it was one of the greatest meals and you wanted others to know about it? Uh, In fact, you didn't want others to just know about it. You wanted to take people with you to have that meal. Or maybe you've been a fan of maybe not just a place to go eat, maybe a a place to go. Uh, You've gone somewhere on vacation and you're a fan of this place because of the the, um, amenities that they have, the accommodations that they can offer, the, the staff is so friendly. And so you're a fan of a particular place to go for vacation. Or maybe you're a fan of some particular merchandise that you know this is the best and You're so much of a fan that you not only want people to know about it, but you want people to experience it. You want people to be involved in that. You want them to have that same thing that you have. Well, there's something that I'm much more of a fan of today than the gut pack or a place to go on vacation. I want to share with you today that I want to be a fan of Jesus. 
So much so that I want people to know about him and not just to know about him, but to experience him and have him experience in their life and to be living through them. And as we think about those kinds of things, we know that there are things that we want to be a disciple of, something that we're we're an adherent of. We began a couple of weeks ago a series that we're calling Teamwork. And as we think about teamwork, we put together a definition of team. Team is two or more people who share a common goal and are actively working to accomplish that goal. You see, we asked the, the, we thought about the concept of God placing us on a team. And, and really, as a church, we're on a team. God has placed us on his team by putting us in his church. And we have two or more of us, and we have a common goal. And hopefully, we're actively working toward accomplishing that goal. God has placed us in that way. Trinity Baptist Church has gone so far as to share many years ago in the worship guide. Something that says something similar to this, we've adjusted a little bit to make a little more sense, I believe. Trinity Baptist Church, we join together to worship God, to reach people, to make disciples, and serve others in the name of Jesus and for the glory of God. That's who we are. That's who we decided we're going to be. If you want to know who we are, we ought to be able to point to that and you can look at it and read it. But even more than that, we hope you could look at us and see it. That we are joining together to worship God. That we are joining together to reach people. We're joining together to make disciples. And we're joining together to serve others in the name of Jesus and for God's glory. A couple weeks ago, we began with we joined together to worship God. Well, how do we do that? We, we came up with these two or these three ways. Before I share those with you, let me encourage you to look in Luke 9 and Acts chapter 2 this morning. Just put your finger in one of those two places, Luke chapter 9 and Acts chapter 2. We're going to get there in just a second. Before we get there, we talked about worshiping God and how are we to worship God. And we, we recommended that these would be some ways that we would do that. Number one, to be sensitive to worship. You see, it's about God and it's not about us. And we need to have a sensitivity when we come to worship. Corporate worship as well as be sensitive during the week as we go to worship God in the world. When you go to work, when you go to school, when you go to the grocery store, when you have your leisure time, when you go walking your dog, when, whenever it is, whatever you do, be sensitive to the worship that's around you because people are watching. It's more about God. We need to make God's agenda more important than our agenda. Uh, this past weekend, getting uh, to be a part just on Friday night with our students at the Disciple Now as things got kicked off, there was a definition that uh, one of the speakers talked about was sin. And what was sin? Sin is simply doing our agenda over God's agenda. Doing what we want over what God wants. Now, you know, what happens hopefully is in time when we spend more time with God, as we find out that he changes what we want and we begin to want what he wants. And that's the obedience of a Christian life. But sometimes we come to value what we want when it's different from God. Sin is choosing to go our way instead of going God's way. It's more about God's agenda than it is ours. Number two was to be expectant of worship. Expect something of our time together. Expect something of your day this week. Expect something as God lives through you. You see, God is the audience. We are, not the, we are not the ones who are spectators. I know you're looking up here right now, but hopefully you're listening and the Holy Spirit is still working in our service to convince us of truth, to let us know what we need to do in our life. So as we think about what we've done, we are, we are not spectators, but we are worshipers. We are participants in this act of worship together. God is our audience and we are the worshipers. The third thing was to have a response from worship. As a result of our time together this morning, I hope that you will leave here changed. And always continually, every week, being changed a little bit, more and more like Jesus, God's Son. Uh, We need to do all we can to be more like him every day that we live. Have a response for him. Pray for God's activity and join him in it. Be faithful. Be obedient to the things that God has already shared with us. We come together to worship God. We also said we come together to reach people. Well, how do we reach people? Well, we said that we would reach people in this way. One, first of all, is to live it, to demonstrate the change that Jesus has brought into our lives in full view of everybody that's watching, of everybody that's observing. People are watching you whether you know it or not. And you know, the the sad thing is they will remember the hiccups, they will remember the mess-ups much more than they remember the consistent faithful living. And so we have to continually, as Christ followers, live a life before people that lets them know that we really believe what we live. And, you know, we talk about the Bible, and you can say you believe it all, but you only believe the parts that you do. 
when we find it a part of our life, that's where we find ourselves being obedient to God's Word. We only believe the part of the Bible that we'll find ourselves actively doing. So, live it full of you of all that are watching. Matthew chapter 5 and 14, 16 tells us that Jesus says to the disciples, You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do they light a lamp and put it under a bowl, but instead they put it on its stand and it will give light to everyone in the house. And then he says, In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. They're supposed to see how we live. So, first of all, live it. Second of all, we're to tell it. In our world today, we have the world that's not really listening. They're not really waiting to hear what it is we have to say. But the Holy Spirit's role in our world is to continue to convince people to be prepared to hear what it is that we do need to tell them. So we need to be ready and willing to tell them when we can. We come together to worship. We come together to reach people. But the third aspect this morning that we look at, who are we as Trinity Baptist Church? We say this, the third aspect of who we say we are is that we come together, we join together to make disciples, to make disciples. Making disciples, what is a disciple? Merriam-Webster defines disciple this way, one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of another or a convinced adherent of a school or of an individual. Someone who accepts and assists in the spreading of the doctrines of another. Or a convinced adherent of a school or of an individual. You could say a little bit this morning that we can be disciples of a lot of things. I know people today who are disciples of Wall Street. I know friends today who are disciples of ESPN. I know people who are disciples of all kinds of things. So, so what are we a disciple of? How will we be a disciple in those ways? You know, Little League Baseball is a big deal. Uh, it's a big deal here in Kerrville. It's a big deal in the state of Texas. And, and something happens toward the tail end of the summer that's really neat to watch. If you get a chance on ESPN to watch it, you watch the Little League World Series. And we watch little boys... I say little boys, young men and young women who have developed their ability to play the game of baseball or the game of softball. And you know what? They play it as good, if not better, than some of the professionals that they play. To, to, we, we're paying to go watch them play. You know, th- these guys and these girls are so incredible in their skills. They didn't get there by counting the hours that they spent at the pool. They didn't get there by finding out how many buffets they went to last week. They didn't get there by how many times they had sleepovers at somebody's house. They got there because they were dedicated enough to give the time and the effort to make themselves the very best that they can be. Now, we lived in Waco several years back. And in Waco, we lived in a section right outside of Waco that's called Woodway. And Woodway has a school district that's called Midway. And Midway has a little league baseball uh, has, has a baseball, a little league that's there. And the, the way that they do it is probably they do it in a lot of other places. You sign up to play little league. You have all the teams playing. And then at the end of the season, they have an all-star team. And the all-star team, they get selected. And then the, the game begins. Because then they're trying to make it to the Little League World Series. Well, I know of some players that were in our church and what they had to do and the families, what they had to do. They sold themselves out for Little League for the summer. They, they had to in order to go as far as they wanted to go. The, the particular families, the, these boys and these girls, they practiced every day of the week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Every day these boys and girls were getting together to practice. And they're practicing for two and three hours a day. And, and they would get together and they, they said no to family vacations. They said no to extra time at the movie theaters. They said no to sleepovers with their friends. They said no to everything so they could commit themselves to Little League Baseball and Little League Softball. And, and the good thing, the, 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 the rewarding thing about Midway was that the Midway team made it to the World Series one year. The boys did. And the girls, the softball, made it to the World Series two times and won it. And they came back and, and they gave themselves. But what did they do? They practiced every day. Families decided to say, this is most important in our life. We don't care that I have a job. Sometimes we're taking vacation to go practice baseball. 
a family would build a meal for all the other families in the evening because all the families were there helping the teams practice. They sold themselves out for Little League Baseball. They were disciples of Little League Baseball. And the reward was going to come if they had a chance to go to Williamsport or uh, to, to play in the Little League World Series. Well, for Midway, it happened because they had a chance to go and come back. And some were successful in winning and some were successful in going. But when we stop and think about what is Jesus asking of us, if we come together as a faith family to worship God, and if we come together as a faith family to reach people, and if we come together as a faith family to make disciples, what kind of disciples are we asking God to help us make? People that will kind of give half their time or people that will give some of their time or people who will be sold out for the cause of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus doesn't want us to say no to all the things in the world, to come be at the church all the time. Jesus wants us to take him with us as we go into all the world to do the things that we're to do. And so as we think about making a disciple, what is it that Jesus is looking for? In Luke chapter 9, verse 23 this morning, you have your Bibles turned to Luke 9. Look at verse 23. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If you want to come after me, if you want to be my disciples, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Jesus gave us three commitments if we're to follow him in discipleship. The first one is to deny ourselves. Now, that doesn't mean to deny that you exist because you look around, we're here. We're, we know we exist. That's not what we're denying. But what is it that he asks us to deny? He asks us to deny the self-centered lifestyle. I'll go back to the definition that our students had this weekend of sin. Of denying the fact that I have my way and God has his way and I've got to deny my way for God's way. Back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had, a, had an opportunity to do what they wanted to. God gave them freedom. And God said, here's your plan. And they decided to do it their way. And as a result, they sinned. So what we come to, we deny our self-centered lifestyle. We take up our cross daily. We take up our purpose daily. We take up who we are on a daily basis. Not one time uh, in our lifetime, not one time a week, but every single day we take up our cross. And what do we do with it? We follow Jesus. We make Jesus the one who's most important in our life. And as we do that, we become disciples of Christ. And as we do that, we have the ability to make disciples of Christ. One visiting minister was getting the red carpet tour of another minister's church. And he'd just gone through a renovation somewhat like we've done. And the minister was going and said, well, look at our pretty carpet. And this is the new carpet we have and our newly padded pews. And we have all this nice woodwork that we've put in with this new sound system. Everything looks so good. It looks so nice. And this minister was, oh, that's so good. And they walked outside just about the same time that it was getting dark. And the lights came on a huge cross that was on top of the church. He said, you see that cross? That cross cost us $10,000. And the other minister said, well, you got ripped off. He said, what do you mean we got ripped off? He said, there was a time when you could get those for free. And what I mean by that? You know, there was a time that Christians didn't wear crosses, but crosses wore Christians. There was a time when, when you said something of following Jesus, it cost you something. And it might even cost you your life. It might even cost you your life on a cross. And so Martin Luther says this, he says, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. The cross is a constant reminder of the cost of following Jesus. To come to Jesus Christ is free. Jesus did everything for us. We don't have to do anything for it. But to follow Jesus will cost you everything you have. And sometimes in a church, we've been sold a wrong bill of goods. We think, oh, it's just going to be nice and easy. But let me tell you what, when you give your life to Christ, it's only then that you truly experience what Jesus says when he says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that I might give you life and give it abundantly. Give it to the full. Give it greater than you can even imagine because of the life that God wants to bring into us. To come to Christ is free, but to follow Jesus will cost us everything we have. 
We looked last week at Acts chapter 2 as we thought about reaching people and what happened. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. And, and then they added those numbers to the church that day and they began to rally and began to build. What happened after that? What happened after that? Look with me, if you will, in Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 42. In Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse, verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching." and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And notice what else it says. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. And every day they continued to meet together at homes and ate toge- in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and, and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The church has begun. Discipleship has begun. Conversion has taken place and discipleship has moved forward. People are continuing to listen to the doctrines of the, of the apostles. They've made themselves available to listen to the instructions that the apostles are given. And it's not just one apostle telling everybody. It's in small groups. It's in the, as they begin to share person to person and testimony to personal witness and, and live accounts of what they were able to witness and see in their life. I want to encourage you that if you come to worship, it's a great thing for us to come together to listen to God and to sing songs of worship. But if we find ourselves not involved in a small group of people that are taking the word of God and slowly looking at it and talking about it, we're missing it. I can't say it any other way, but that we're just missing it. If you don't find yourselves in a Bible study group somehow, some way, continuing to be a part of the apostles' teaching, continuing to let someone share with you the word of God, ask questions about it. Let it become who you are. We're missing it. They continued in the apostles' teaching. Instruction was important. But not only that, as they continued in small groups, the fellowship was, was great. The fellowship was, was kind. It was sweet. They had a close relationship. They had a community that they lived among one another. And in living in that community, there were two other things that they did. They ate together. I don't know how it is if, if, at your house, but when you sit down at your meals, it's not like when you're having a debate or when you have an argument going on, it's kind of at ease. It, it's when you sit down and you begin to share openly. And, and sometimes when you have people over, it's great to have friends over. And you get to share meals. You get to know who they are. You get to have an intimate time sometimes together because you learn stories about one another. Uh, you, you build bridges. You, you make memories that way. They continue to do that by eating together, but also in breaking of bread. The breaking of bread and also in the taking of communion. As they would get together, they would remember that Jesus' word said, when you take this bread, you break it, remember me. When you drink this cup, you remember me. And it became special because they recognized that Jesus is still a part of who they are. Every time they got together, it was around the fact that the one thing they had in common was Christ. And we do that as a church. And not only that, the fourth thing they did is they prayed for and with each other, along with all the other times of prayer they had. That wasn't the only prayer they had. They had other prayers during the week, during the day, their personal prayers that they had, but they come together to pray specifically. I love when I see people praying. It, it, it's so encouraging to, to know that already today in this place, uh, in Bible studies, in our time of worship, there have been groups that have already asked for God's blessing of this time. That God has, we've asked for God's blessing for our week. We've asked for God's blessing upon those who we know need help. Um, If you want to see prayers answered, let me share with you what you ought to pray. You ought to pray what God wants. God's got this agenda in this world, and if his agenda is bigger than our agenda, and we begin to pray for that, then we know God's going to bring that about. Begin to pray in those ways, and we'll see those prayers being answered. But they got together, and they prayed for one another. They prayed with one another. Their Christian faith was a daily experience. It was a day-to-day reality. It wasn't something they did on Sunday. It was something they did every day that they got together. We don't meet on Monday or Tuesday. We meet on Wednesdays. We don't meet necessarily on Thursday or Friday or Saturday. We come together again on Sunday. But, but we still have times of gathering. We still have times that we're not together. And as we're not together, we still worship. We still reach. And we still come to the place of making disciples. 
we've talked about what is a disciple, but how do you really make them? I mean, how can you make a disciple? Well, I want you to do something with me. If you look at your little finger, if you've been in a class with me, you probably know what's coming. Have you ever seen your little finger grow? If you've ever seen your little finger grow, we need to talk after the worship service today. You probably have never seen your little finger grow. A second question I would ask is, is it bigger now than it was when you were born? Well, how did it get that way? It got that way because you went to bed and you slept and you ate and you exercised and you did the disciplines of living life to the point that it's grown to the size that it is today. How do you grow as a follower of Jesus? You put those disciplines of taking in and exercising and becoming a disciple so that you grow in your faith so that when people see you, they don't just see you, they see God. And they don't just see God, they see someone who loves them and has something for them and they want it because it's what they need. We come to what does it make, how do we make disciples? A simple response is simply this, disciples make disciples. Disciples, you become a disciple of Jesus Christ and you will begin to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Does God really expect us to worship him? Does he really expect us to reach people? Does he really expect us to make disciples? You know, I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. In the church, we sometimes think we're doing a really good job if we, if we could baptize five more this year than we did last year. If we can move up the five, we got five more this year than last year. Or maybe we have 35 more people coming to Bible study groups on Sunday. We're doing good. Or we have another 100 coming to worship when we combine our, so we're doing great. And we start thinking, we start thinking, oh, we're doing great because these more, this many more people are coming. When that's not the way that we ought to evaluate what we're doing because God doesn't ask us to evaluate this way. God asks us to evaluate this way. Of those people who are coming to worship God, how many of those people who are coming to worship God are actually reaching people and of those people who are reaching people how many of those are actually making disciples and next week we'll talk about of those that are making disciples how many of those are really serving others in Jesus's name for God's glory see it's not about do we measure ourselves this way for success but we ought to be measuring ourselves this way are we making more disciples are we reaching more people are we worshiping god those are the ways that we come to understand what god has asked us to do and how do we do that acts 1 8 tells us when the holy spirit comes upon you you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in jerusalem judea samaria and to the ends of the earth what does he say he says this Power first, witness second. Power first, witness second. And it comes from the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit gives us power and we recognize the power that's within us, we become witnesses so that all those who are watching can see that we are sold out. Not to Little League. Not to Gut Packs. Not to ESPN. Not to Wall Street. But we're sold out on making disciples because that's what changes the world. That's what changes us. Be a disciple. Be a follower of Jesus. Choose to grow in Christ. Share your faith with those that are around you by how you live and what you say. And be on the move from glorifying God, worshiping God, to reaching people. And from reaching people to making disciples. And then help others to do the same. There's a story that gets circulated about a little boy who fell out of his bed one night and he began to cry. And his dad goes in to check on him and he picks him up and he holds him a little bit and he's trying to comfort him. And he says, Dad, and he's crying. He says, Dad, I, 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 I went to sleep too close to where I went in. You know, he just got in the bed, he fell asleep, and he fell out. True story, but also a revealing story of the church. There are a lot of people who will go to sleep too close to where they got in. Jesus asks us to come be a convert, yes, but he doesn't leave us there. He wants us to be a disciple. The church is is limping today because there are a lot of people who are too close to where they got in. 
They've not moved forward in the kingdom. Yes, if they die, they're going to go to heaven because Jesus is their Lord and Savior. But they've not become a disciple of Christ. They've not followed him. They've not matured in Christ. They've not grown in him because they've not allowed the disciplines that God gives to us to make us who God wants us to be. We are to be more like Jesus every day that we live. And if that is not happening, it's probably because we are choosing our agenda over God's agenda. Don't go to sleep too close to where you go in, to where you got in. Disciples make disciples. Let us worship God together. Let us reach people together. Let us make disciples together. Making disciples of everyone everywhere because the Lord tells us he will be with us to the very end of the age. And to God be the glory for all he has done, all he is doing, and all he has yet to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today and how grateful we are that you have asked us, that you've commanded us, that you've called us to go and make disciples. Lord, help us to be faithful to that here in our church and to encourage even as we walk alongside with other churches how grateful we are that our youth group got together with First Baptist Kerrville this weekend to do an event called Disciple Now. And how you talked to and spoke to our students. And we pray that in the days ahead, we'll learn more about what that means as we walk with them and as they challenge us as a church. Father, if there's anyone here that is yet to know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that they'll come forward during our time of response. That we might share with them how they can trust you in their life as Lord and Savior. Others who may be here who are wanting to be a part of a faith family that's doing work in our community and around the world. Others who may be here just simply say, I want prayer. And would you help them to come forward if they'd like to pray by themselves or to pray with the minister? Father, we want to make that available. Work in our lives and cause us to be obedient to your will, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Lord Jesus, I love you. for our closing song. Aren't you glad to be a part of the family of God? And what a joy to be a part of a church that makes disciples. John, thank you for that incredible message. Let's praise him as we go out and sing the family of God. I'm so glad.